Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it is a culture of UTM uh, to be punctual or slightly earlier than punctuality. So <laughs> normally we do this in many ways, not only um, in conducting our event, but also in achieving what we we're supposed to achieve. So we hope this is uh, a good introduction to some of you here, especially Dato Imad, uh, so that we can complete our project much earlier based on our gun chat. Mm. Today I'm very uh, proud to invite all of you to be with us, and we have a very distinguished person that I know in my life uh, by the name of Professor Larry Suskin, and he is a professor a well-known professor from MIT. Uh, it is not Malaysia Institute of Technology, Larry. Malaysia, I want the, the name of UTM in the 70s was National Institute of Technology. So they wanted to make it Malaysia Institute of Technology. He said that was taken. So they said, wow, this cannot be. M two MIT in the world, it's only one MIT. Okay, then we realized there is uh, uh, an instit institution called MIT. Uh, Larry is very distinguished for his work um, in a lot of uh, issues related to conflict resolution. Um, he is heading an institute called Building Consensus Institute. You have to read that that phrase completely in two different intonation, Building Consensus Institute. Otherwise, Building Consensus Institute, if you take it as it is, sometimes people thought that uh, the name of the building is consensus. Um, so I've been to uh, uh, MIT a few times, engaging uh, Larry, and we were engaged uh, last year um, in a program called Water Diplomacy and it was uh, organized by MIT, Harvard and Tufts and co-organized by UTM. So it was very good. I was with Professor Zul Kifli, uh, Zul Kifli Yusuf attending that program and during that program we tried to understand the importance of building consensus in environmental management and sustainability. We found that the um, experience we gained in M at MIT at that time was very fruitful in understanding not only uh, the needs for development, but also the importance of sustainability in that management. So today we have a very distinguished person that will, 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 be, will be sharing with us uh, uh, his thought, and he gave me a very, um, very catchy title for the premier lecture today. Wow, you keep on changing. Uh, the title he gave me last week was, last week or the week before, New Tools for Democratic Decision Making. So just now he changed it to New Tools for Democratic Decision Making and New Role for Higher Education. So, if you allow him for another day, he will add another few words for him. So I said uh, to myself, uh, let him conduct this uh, lecture. And this premier lecture is very prestigious in UTM. Uh, we try to organize for 10 times a year, and this is the fourth time. Uh, last two weeks, we had Professor Tony Sinski uh, from MIT as well and he was a recipi uh, recipient of uh, UTM Honorary Doctorate in Biotechnology, Industrial Biotechnology. Prior to that, we had uh, Ms. Sarah Fali from uh, Global Knowledge Initiative, uh, and she was very uh, instrumental in bringing science to people. So she is representing NGO as spin-off of AAAS, Association of American Association of Advancement of Science that produce uh, a very prestigious journal called Science. So I'm not going to 
prolong my introduction to him uh, about about Larry. I think uh, you will know Gary uh, by listening to his talk and his deliberation on a new title called New Tools for Democratic Decision Making and a New Role for Higher Education. Larry. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be part of your lecture series and excited to be visiting Malaysia for the first time and delighted to see Zaini again and to see others that I haven't been in touch with for some time who I met walking into the room, which is always very exciting. Um, I'm going to try in one hour to summarize what we would usually teach in 12 weeks. That means I'm going to be selective and go fast. But then we're going to have a lot of time for discussion. And I do hope you will challenge the ideas and offer your own in response. Um, I would be disappointed if I were not able to provoke you to participate in the conversation. I took as my starting point what has been written about your premier lecture series and what some of your previous participants have said, which is that it matters how we link together government, higher education, civil society, and science. It matters how we make the connections amongst them. You have a PhD in policy studies that tries to educate people about those connections. I think we have to worry about those connections in practice, in everyday life, not just what we say about them in the university, not just what we say in theory. So my objective is to start with what we've been learning in practice in a great many parts of the world about involving people in the decisions that affect them, involving people in communities all over the world in the decisions that affect them, the collective decisions, the decisions of government, the decisions of industry, the decisions of civil society. It's my premise that we will continue to confront increasing complexity and uncertainty, no matter how much work we do, no matter how much good decision analysis we do. We're going to be confronting increasing complexity and uncertainty. Complexity in the political world because of technology, complexity in the ecological world because of climate change. Uncertainty because of climate change. We don't know what exactly is going to happen in which coastal areas, but we know there will be sea level rise. We know there will be increased storm intensity. We know at some point we will have these effects so how, if we can't say exactly what's going to happen, where and when, how do we make decisions now in the face of that increasing uncertainty and increasing complexity? The socio-ecological systems, the people, the governmental units, the governance systems, and the natural systems connected together are too complex, the relationships are too complex for us to model them with confidence. It's not a reason we should stop trying to understand them, but we should not pretend that we can model them and forecast what will happen with them with certainty. In the face of increasing complexity and uncertainty, especially with regard to the decisions that affect people's long-term health and safety, the only way for government, which makes many of those decisions, to achieve legitimacy when it makes those decisions is to engage 
the people affected in those decisions and helping to make them. If everybody's making decisions up for you and, don't, and they don't consult you and all those decisions affect you, you're not going to be pleased with the decisions or the decision makers. So when I was thinking of the title for this talk, my first instinct was to talk about tools for democratic decision making. I put the democratic in because I'm talking about governmental decisions which affect people and which they have a right to participate in in some way. The definition of that right changes all over the world depending on the constitution, the culture, the history. But in most places, especially in places that say they are a democracy, there is some role for people in the decisions that affect them. And I'm going to talk about what I would argue is a new form of public engagement. That's my term for this subject we're talking about, public engagement. Especially in situations that I call science intensive. Decisions where if you make a mistake, you destroy the environment and you kill people. This is not just my political judgment versus yours. I'm talking about science intensive policy disputes where lives and the sustainability of natural systems are at stake. Now, when I look around the world, and I work in many, many different places for four decades on these kinds of problems. In general, still today, the first instinct of government, when it has to make a decision that it knows will affect people, is to say, we must do this right, we must do analysis, then we can decide. So government agencies, commissions, task force, consultants, we will do the analysis and we will figure out what the right thing to do is. And then because we are a democratic country, we will announce that decision. We won't just take it. We will announce it so the public knows. And then through hearings or letters to the editor, or lobbying politically, or direct action in the streets, the public will respond and the government tries to defend the decision that it made. Decide.